the sweetest frame but holy we lean on Jesus name but holy we lean on Jesus name but holy we lean on Jesus name come on let's lean on him this morning Come on, let's lean on him this morning. Come on, would you extend your spirits? Would you extend your heart? Would you open to him and lean on him? Lean on him on a Sunday morning. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Let's lift our hands one more time. Cross this up toward him in Jesus' name. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Doesn't matter how good it sounds. It doesn't matter how promising it can be. If you've already wholly leaned on Jesus. You know, there's a difference in being not for sale and being sold out. Not here to cliche our way through a Sunday morning. But everything's for sale. Reminded of a story of a man who was a Coca-Cola fan. And he would go across the nation and he said, you never find someone who says, I'm sorry, that sign or that antique or that, that thing is not, is not for sale. I'm sorry. that You never find them where you can't write a big enough check that it doesn't become for sale. He said, but walk into a Walmart and try to buy a $20 toaster. And there's not one on the shelf, and there's not one on the back. And the manager, no matter how big of a fuss you put up, is going to come to you and tell you, I'm sorry, sir, you cannot buy a toaster from here today. We are sold out. There is a difference in purporting yourself to be not for sale and simply being already sold out. I wholly lean. On Jesus' name. There's nothing about me that's not already sold out to him. And so no matter how sweet you phrase it, I dare not trust it. For I'm already leaning on the master. Why don't we lift our hands and let's wholly lean on him on a Sunday morning. Oh, come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. 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 Amen. Why don't we clap our hands to the Lord and make a joyful noise on a Sunday morning? Praise the Lord Jesus. Look at your neighbor and smile at him. Tell him the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. I want to turn your attention to the book of Ezra chapter 9. Everybody say thank God for his word. The book of Ezra chapter 9. We're going to be reading in verse number 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And uh, the media team, whatever they're paying you, we're going to give you an increase know what zero times five is but we're going to give you five times whatever you made last Sunday I've got them loaded down with scriptures this morning and so we're going to move through a number of biblical references that I feel will be um, a help and a guiding light to us look at your neighbor and say a space for grace come on look at somebody and say a space for grace 
The Bible says in Ezra chapter 9, verse number 5, And at the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out of my hands unto the Lord. And here's what the priest said, Oh my God, I, somebody say I, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is growing up into the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we our kings and our priests, and he's one of the priests, this is Ezra, the priest of Israel been delivered into the hands of the kings of the lands to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been shewed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail, everybody say a nail, in His holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving for bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving and to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah woo, and in Jerusalem. Oh, I'm so excited about the Word of God on a Sunday morning. I want to preach on this subject, a space for grace. Let's lift our hands one more time before you're seated in Jesus' name. God, we love you. We thank you. We worship you, Jesus. You're worthy of all glory, power, dominion, righteousness, and might is yours, God. We praise your holy name. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Why don't you clap your hands one more time? You might even smile at your neighbor again. I know it's overcast on the outside. Baby, there's sunshine on the inside if you've got the Holy Ghost. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated on a Sunday morning. The speech and behavior of a soldier, if you've ever sat with one, and our hats off, not only on Veterans Day, but today for the soldiers who have kept our homeland safe, allowing us the liberty and the ability to gather in a manner like we are gathering today. Thank God for them and for this great nation. Now, if you've ever sat with one of these men or women, a uh, soldier of a war campaign or a POW, a prisoner of war, they can seem a little... Um, edgy at times when the subject of freedom comes up. I've sat with many of them, had one that was as unto a second father for me. And, <laughs> you know, it, boy, it'd get heated. And like my Uncle June says, they'll fight at the drop of a hat and they'll drop the hat if they need to. Because those men have been in positions where they have seen, some of them, the devastation of what captivity can do to a people, even in a civil manner, a civil captivity. They've seen the power and the struggle and the energy and the efforts that are mandated to overturn that kind of captivity. And some of them that were housed in prisoners' camp during war times, they have felt the sting and the pain and, and the degradation of being a prisoner of captivity and war during those times. And so, when the conversation of our freedom comes up, boy, they get testy real quick, don't they, Brother Masters? And they're more careful with their vote. They're more careful with their positioning of their politics perhaps and that's not the stump upon which I stand today but hear me out for a moment there they're more proactive in some manners and and they steer way clear of some proverbial slippery slopes because they know if we ever get on that downhill slide 
They know. They've experienced. They did not read it in the history books. That no, nobody told. They experienced in living color where it can lead and how quickly it can get there and how hard, if ever possible, it is to get it back righted up how it should be situated. Can a veteran in the house say amen? amen. And so it's easy to read chapter 9 of the book of Ezra, which if you get to chapter 9, you're almost done with the book. And to feel as though Ezra who is just fresh out of captivity, is overacting a little bit about some here tell he said, she said, that's been handed to him. Amen? Amen. But if you know Ezra, then you know he's been in captivity. If you know Ezra, then he knows life without the rebuilt city. If you know Ezra, he knows what it's like living without the temple constructed. He knows what it's like to not have the ability to go and experience the presence and the protocol of engaging with God. If you've ever been a person who has walked away from the table of the Lord and found yourself back in the bleak weariness of what the wilderness offers you and you somehow through the grace of God make your way back into his presence, you become a person who other people would feel like maybe overreact a little bit when things come your way. But we must understand on a Sunday morning if you've ever felt captivity. See, not everybody was born under a padded pew in a Pentecostal environment. Some of us were born with drugs in our system while we were still in our mother's womb. Some of us were born in neighborhoods and and, and jurisdictions and situations that weren't polished and prime and prim. And so when we finally get out of that captivity, the liberty and the freedom And when things encroach those boundary lines, we seemingly to everybody else overreact a little bit. Ezra could be blamed for this perhaps, but Ezra is not new on the scene. And Ezra has seen what happens when the issues that have been handed to him, and they are not our focal point on a Sunday morning, but they do stand in, 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 in exhibit and example for what our focal point is on this particular Sunday morning in that it had been told to Ezra that even after God had brought his people out of captivity, even after God had moved on the hearts of kings that we'll discuss here shortly to rebuild the city, the wall, and the temple that had been demolished, even though all that had happened, the same sin that got them into captivity from which God had now delivered them out of That's not good English, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Is now happening again. Brother Alan Michael, our newly appointed youth leader, his dear wife, Sister Chelsea, sent me a video the other day. And I'm telling you, I just about lost it. And some of you have already gotten it, so you understand. It's this poor man. His clothes are dirty. It looks like it's fixing to rain. And he's got his arms under this dirty, nasty-looking sheep that's down in this ditch. And boy, he's prying, and he's pulling, and he's yanking, and he's trying to get it. And he finally gets him up, and there's this ah, moment. And the sheep goes, go on, go on, go on, right back in the hole. (laughs) And he said, Brother Ryder, is this what youth pastoring is going to be like? But all we like sheep have gone astray and turned every. It's so easy for God to pluck us out of what we struggled with, for us only to start flirting with and and handling with and messing with the same things that got us into captivity. And here Ezra is. I'm sorry for using you as an example this morning. Here Ezra is, and somebody's talking to him, and they're saying, oh, Ezra, you're not going to believe what's happening. The people of Israel who are no longer in captivity, they have taken to themselves wives of the surrounding heathen nation and those that already had wives have taken wives for their sons 
You have to understand why captivity happened in the first place. To understand why Ezra would start a fast. Literally, not figuratively, pull locks of his hair out and lay in darkness, sackcloth, ashes, and fasting for a long time. Here we pick up when he has stood up from that and begins to pray. Because for a long time all he did was mourn. But Ezra understands the way. Turn with me if you can really quickly to 1 Kings chapter 16 and verse 28 as we reverse a little bit and begin to understand the concept. This is not what Ezra was praying about, but here's the concept that Ezra understands in his mind and in his heart. So Omri slept with his fathers. Omri died, and he was buried in Samaria. Omri, who was a bad, evil king who did the way of Jehoiakim, he, or Jeroboam rather, he said... Uh, uh, he would he would continue with the evil that his forefathers had done. He was dead and he was buried. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. Quickly go to verse number 31. Here's what Ahab did. It came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. So Omri was walking in the sins of Jeroboam if that, as if that was just a light thing. Like as if it wasn't bad enough to just continue that way. Watch what his son Ahab did. Ahab took to wife, everybody say Jezebel. Jezebel. And yes, that's the Hebrew word. We get that same word, Isabel. You say, well, does everybody name it Isabel, a bad person? No. And I hope you don't. But if you do name your baby Jezebel, God help you. And it doesn't make them a particular thing. But we, we need to stop and recognize a couple things about what's going on. Right. Ahab, the king of Israel, northern Israel, whose name meant brother to the father. He wasn't interested in being a son to the father. He wasn't interested in following the orders of the father. He wanted to be beside the father. Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, whose name literally means with Baal. And watch what happens. He went and he served Baal and worshipped him. Continue verse number whatever I gave you. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel, the prince with God. Man, we just stretched this thing out real far. Let me condense it for you then. If you connect yourself to Jezebel who is the son of Ethbel, who is with Baal, then you will wind up serving Baal, and you will build a house for Baal, and you will worship Baal in the temple of Baal. There's no way to get around it. Ezra understood if we connect ourselves as a nation, if we mingle our spiritual, let me take this where it really needs to be for the church, amen, who is the son of Abraham by faith, the spiritual sons of Abraham. If we mingle our seed with the heathen nations among us, then we wind up taking the identity of their gods into our homes. And Ahab, who was known for building ivory palaces, also built groves for heathen gods and temples for heathen gods. And Ezra has the weight of this dynamic on him. Bump your neighbor with the elbow and tell him it's going to get better. Ezra has this weight. That's the weight that drove him to fasting. That's the weight that caused him to literally unroot his hair. That's the weight that made him get in sackcloth and ashes. Ezra is heavy under the weight because he understands when we go that way, when we go that way, God will eventually just allow us to go ahead and go that way. And that way leads to captivity. And that way leads to slavery. And that way leads to a loss of identity. And that way leads to a 
loss of our promises. Somebody preach with me on a Sunday morning. And that way leads to a loss of our blessings. And that way leads to a loss of our voices. I wonder how long, I wonder how long it took Judah to get their pitch back and to get their range back and to get their dance back after captivity. For they had long hung their harps in the willows. They were out of practice. They were uncultured as praisers in the house of God. Ezra's got the weight on him. We cannot go back into captivity. We cannot lose the temple. We can't lose the city. We can't afford for the wall to go down. And so Ezra does a couple of things. One thing Ezra does that's worth pointing out this morning, where I anticipate no one ripping their hair out. I hope no one rips their clothes. And I hope no one puts ashes on their heads today. Or any day. However, we do all that in the spirit. Every day. Ezra did this one thing. You begin reading it in verse 6, which we don't have and we're not going to give you. You can read it. It's a short chapter. But in verse number 6, you start hearing him say things that he repeats in verse number 8. Where he's not saying, God, they. They did this. God, can you believe those sorry sapsuckers? They, no, no. This is what he's saying. He's saying, our bondage, our trespasses, our sin, our iniquity. Ezra took it personally. Ezra took it on personal. I don't believe that Ezra was doing that as the priest. He was a uniquely skilled priest among the priesthood itself. But I don't believe Ezra was doing what he was repenting over. But I believe when the weight of what was going on and the weight of what was in balance that day hit him, he couldn't help but take it personal. Amen man. And Ezra began to repent like Ezra had done it himself. Ezra began to repent like the weight and the choice was on Ezra himself. Can I invite you on a Sunday morning? This message is for everybody. It's for the preacher. It's for the pulpit. It's for the pew. It's for the visitor. It's for the most elderly saint of God here on a Sunday morning. And if we all, like Ezra, would take it on personally, what Ezra got would be given to us he's praying to God and he begins to say phrases like in our bondage you did not forsake us but you moved on the hearts of multiple Persian kings. You can read in Ezra chapter 6 verse 7 and 11 where Darius, who you know in Daniel's time, and the great king, the original great Cyrus, they called him in history Cyrus the Great. Read with me. Let the word, this is their words, uh, one of them amen the other to this edict right here. Let the work of the house of God alone. Leave it alone. Let it be. Don't stop it. Don't hinder it. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in this place. Verse 11. Here we go. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house and let it be set up and let him be hanged on that timber and let his house be made a dung hill for trying to go against what I have said should have. When, when, when Ezra says you've moved on the hearts of Persian kings, I mean God moved on the hearts of Persian kings. Things. They put laws in motions. They changed entire judgments. They stopped their judicial processes and interrupted the natural flow of how a nation remains an empire. You want to think of something supernatural? An intervention that comes in and suspends natural flow? This is what happened for the people of God so that their bondage could be removed and the temple could be rebuilt mind you the temple was their relationship with God amen, amen. 
We understand that's where God resided in their covenant and in their testament. They had to go to the temple. That's where worship happened. That's where dedication happened. That's where incense was received up. That's where baptism happened. That's where repentance happened. That was the altar. That was the laver. That was the holy of holies. Everything centered around that. What he's saying is you had kings change their kingdom so we could have relationship with you. Oh, what a space of grace that God has given us. We don't have to die to our own sins. We don't have to mount Calvary's cross. We don't have to pay for the process of sanctification. He once offered himself, he who was without sin, took on sin for us that we could live life abundantly then after Darius and Cyrus the great Artaxerxes who was a following king of Persia said in chapter 7 verse 21 of this same book I even I Artaxerxes the king to make a decree to all the treasurers which are beyond the river that whosoever whatsoever rather Ezra the priest the scribe of the law of God of heaven shall require of you it shall be done and do it fast whatever Ezra needs so that relationship between God and the people of God can happen. Do it. Whatever he needs, give it to him. Whatever they ask for, make it happen and do it pronto. Because even a heathen king understood the blessing and the might and the authority and the power of relationship. Ezra's praying to God. He's reminding him of some things. He's saying, you gave us a space of grace. You gave us a period of time in which all of these things transpired so that we could have relationship with you again. Now for a little space. It's an, it's an odd wording. You, you can take this scripture down. Now for a little space of grace. Ezra calls it a little space. Some renditions or versions, if you will, say for but a brief moment. How is it that there was such brevity in Ezra's understanding? They had been many, many years. Don't have the exact date. No one does. In captivity, they would see other captivity in their future, perhaps greater in some instances. And many scholars, depending on where you date it, there's a range, Bishop Master, somewhere between 60 and 80 years where there was a space of time. There was a space of time where the fire burned in the Holy of Holies. There was a, the holy place, rather. There was a space of time where the laver of water was troubled. There was a space of time where incense burned. There was a space of time in the temple again where the, the menorah shed light upon the shoe bread. There was a space of time where the brazen altar was lit and where things died upon it. There was a space of time where we could have the most spiritual uh, access to relationship with God that man could possibly know in that day and in that hour. There was a space. You say 60 to 80 years is a long time. But not in the general scheme of the length of Israel's life. 60 to 80 years is just a small amount of time. It's just a little space. God, I see these things happening and I know where they're leading. But you've given us a little space where you've not only spoke to us, but you've spoke to us by speaking to kings of one of the greatest nations that this world's history would ever see. And you gave us a little space. Can I tell somebody on a Sunday morning, you don't have much time, but on the other hand, you have plenty of time. Oh, I like to preach to somebody on a Sunday morning. You don't have much time, but you got plenty of time. They say that a generation is 
is 30 years long. Take into account the longer lifespan of biblical times, however you want to. But you got time for at least one or maybe two generations to get this thing right with God so that the space of time is enough for you to get it right. The space of time is enough for you to create, establish, found and ground a relationship with God. And it's enough time for you to pass it on to the... You've got enough time to pray your mama through. You've got enough time to pray your neighbor through. You've got to, you ain't got much time, but you've got plenty of time. Oh, I wish somebody would shout for a space for grace. I wish somebody would wail because of a space for grace. You ought to clap your hands. You ought to make your feet dance for God has given us a space. I think sometimes we beckon God and we ask Him, I want you to change everything. I want you to pull me out of my circumstances. I want you to pull me out of my realities. For Ezra, it would have been him asking God, I want you to pop us up to where there's nobody around us. No, 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 no. We don't need to rid the world of heathen nations. God has a plan for heathen nations. Amen. His plan is to woo them through your relationship with Him. Well, let's put it in reverse and roll over that one more time. His plan for everybody else is that he would woo them into the house of God. He would woo them into relationship with him. How? By them observing your relationship with him. Let's not try to get rid of the heathen nations. Let's use the space of time that we have to Deepen our re- Ooh, Let's raise our hands on a Sunday morning. Oh, if you could just kill them. If you could just boop, flick them off the face of the globe that we wouldn't have to do. No, 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 no. That's not the will of God. You have a space of time. And we need to focus on what's going on in that space. The floor has been cleared. The proverbial whiteboard has been erased. Let's walk up to the table with God. And let's begin working on our relationship. With, oh, if I could do something different. If I could be somebody. If I could have been born in a different family. If I could just. No, no. No, no, you're losing time. You're wasting time. Right here. Right here. Right now. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the space of grace that's big enough for me and it's big enough for my family and it's big enough for my addictions and it's big enough for my turmoil and it's big enough for the lemons that life has handed so that me and Jesus can make lemonade does anybody believe what I'm preaching on a Sunday morning you and I have taken advantage of a dispensation All things apostolic, Bishop Wilson and Brother Jeremy Wilbanks, my friend, just went through a big discourse and are continuing through a discourse of dispensations. And if you want to be theologically argumentative about that, that's fine with me. You probably just need to go listen to them because whatever they say is more than likely right. However, that's a pretty fast disclaimer. One thing you can't discount is that there are eras of time in which God, you could call it what you want to call it, not call it what you don't want to call it. There are eras of time in which God plainly deals with people in a certain way. Today, for by grace are ye saved through faith. This is, you are living in the space of grace. And we don't need to get to looking at it as though we have forever. You don't have forever. In fact, you don't have much time. But you have plenty of time to do what the space of grace was designed to do for you and your family. Purposes of the space of grace. Number one, 
in verse number 8, you can read it, to leave us a remnant to escape. Somebody say the rapture. And the second would be to give us a nail in His holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And there Ezra, under the auspice of the power of God, is seeing bondage to come. I'm not talking just about Babylonian and Assyrian captivity. I'm not talking just about historical Old Testament biblical history captivity. But Paul wrote to the church at Rome in chapter 7 verses 18 through 24 and he described to them in, in, in a bit of a rush that seems emotional but you and I can learn from on a Sunday morning exactly what captivity he was talking about. Verse number 18 of Romans chapter 7 says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, everybody say my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I cannot find, I cannot figure how to do good. For the good that I would, I do not. And the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I would do that I would not, It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Ah, I find then a law, a repetitive pattern of being. When I would do good, evil is present with me. Baby, you and I in captivity right now. For I delight in the law of God. I delight in the law of God in the inward man. But I see another law in my members. See, my God, brother writer, this sounds like a, an internal war going on. Oh, yeah, that's exactly how Paul felt about it. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law which is in of sin, which is in my members. Can I tell you the space of grace ain't got nothing to do with, this, with Babylon, but it's got to do with the spirit of Babylon that is still pressing on the earth today. You and I are locked in this flesh and this flesh wants to be lazy and this flesh just wants to have fun and this flesh just wants to eat, 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 eat until it's all eaten up. And I don't just mean physically but I mean mentally and spiritually and financially and lustfully. We are in a war where what we want on the inside has got constant war from what's trying to get us on the outside. We are in captivity but there is is an escape where this immortality where this mortality shall put on immortality and no longer will my immortal flesh hold me captive You ought to show your flesh on a Sunday. Oh, yeah, you will run. Oh, yeah, you will dance. Oh, yeah, you will clap your hands. I refuse. My God, don't let them run by themselves. I refuse to be held in captivity. Let me remind you, there is liberty where the Spirit of the Lord is. Jesus, in fact, said it very plainly. Follow me very quickly in Luke chapter 21. I don't have it marked for myself. Luke chapter 21. Just go through whatever verses that I gave you. It wasn't said by a man of God. It was said by God robed himself in flesh. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. What would make you want to do that? My God. So that, that day, that day, that day, 
there's going to be end of the space of grace so that at that day that it doesn't come upon you unaware quickly the next verse for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the whole earth. You say, well, we dwell on the face of the earth. Yeah, but if you have the Holy Ghost, there is a day a coming, baby, where we aren't going to dwell on this earth any longer. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, the angels beckon me. I can't live at home on this earth anymore. It's going to come on those that dwell on the face of the earth. What do I do about it? Thank you for asking because he gives us the answer in the very next verse. Watch ye, since it's going to happen quickly, since you ain't got a lot of time, even though you have plenty of time, watch ye therefore. The therefore, we got to figure out what the therefore is there for. It's there because the day's going to come in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Watch and pray on Sundays, no. Watch and pray on Monday night, no, 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 no. no. Watch and pray always that you may be accounted God you've given us a space of grace and here's the reason first that you gave it to us so that a remnant of us could escape watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all those things which shall come to pass. The word is interesting there. You say, how oh, you can't prove that's rapture. Oh, yes, I can. The word there is escape, translated in your KJV. But there, I, what's the, Brother Lopez, what's that word escape? What's it mean to you? The what? Say it in English. You would, you would say escape? The Greek word is ek fugo, which is a two-letter prefix, ek, meaning out of, like ecclesia, ek, lasia, those called out. And the word fugo means to fly. Is anybody picking up what I'm laying down? Yes, Watch and pray that you may be worthy to fly out. Baby, if that ain't rapture, if that ain't being rapture ready, I don't know what is. You want to know what the grace dispensation is all about? Getting me and you ready to fly. Getting me and you ready to fly. Getting me and you ready to fly out of the greatest slavery that will ever be seen. Well, if you're not excited about rapture, I'm afraid I got nothing else to hand you on a Sunday morning. Me and you have a space of grace. We got to get Calhoun ready to fly. We got to get West Monroe ready to fly. We got to get Spanish speaking ready to fly. We got to get Vietnamese people ready to fly. We got to get rich people, poor people, broke people, hurt people. We got to get me ready to fly. Somebody say second reason. And so he would give us a nail in his holy place. Give us a nail in his holy place. Brother Zane, prepare to come. That's such a unique phrase. And it's not a phrase that you would go and you would look up in your concordance and say, oh, well, let me exhaust the places in the Bible that say the word nail. Well, it's a lot of places. It was there when that woman drove a tent stake through the temples of a heathen king. Because it literally means peg. It could mean a lot of things. When you and I think peg, and I've heard this preached, and I guess they never studied anything about history or Israeli history. We think peg to like, Israel lived in tents. They ain't have no coat hangers. But it does mean stake. A tent peg. Equally used. You read this near exact phrase. In Isaiah chapter 22 verse 23. So begin in verse 20 and let's read together. Here's what God through the prophet Isaiah gave to the people of Israel. As to what their future would hold. Isaiah chapter 20, 
22, verse 20. Do y'all have it? We're having technical difficulties. I need you to read this. Help us, Jesus. It shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key, somebody say the key, key. of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, he shall shut, and none shall open. This is the last verse. I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. He's going to be a lot of things. I'm going to do things with him, through him, to him. I'm going to set government on him. I'm going to clothe him. I'm going to strengthen him. I'm going to girdle him. I'm showing you how I'm going to lead you and guide you and make it happen. Now, now. Two things. This is 1120. Two things. I'm going to give him the key. I'm going to put it on his shoulder. And, and, and I could take a long time, but just hear me out and go study it if you need to. Google me if you need to. Key to the kingdom. It's representative. It's a sign of authority. And he told you what it was going to be for. Eliakim, you're going to have the key that will unlock the chambers to the king. You're going to have the key that will unlock the, the, the door to his inner court. And you're going to have the key to the access portal. If you shut it, nobody else can open it. If you open it, nobody else can shut it. You're going to say, are there no theologians in the house that are picking up what I'm preaching? Who can enter the kingdom? Why is that important, preacher? Well, that's important because of Matthew chapter 16. That's important because one day Jesus gathered all of his disciples. That's important one day because Jesus sat down and asked them, who am I? That's important because one day a man named Peter stood up and said, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven hath revealed it unto thee. Continue. I say unto thee, thou art Peter. So now we know for sure who he's talking to. And upon this pebble I will build my church. Or, or rather, thou art, thou art Petrus. Thou art Peter. And upon this Petra, boulder. He wasn't building it on Peter. He called Peter a pebble. And then he said on this rock, boulder, of what? Revelation that he is the Son of God. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, are you ready? And I will give unto the keys of the kingdom. Locking and loosing. That's important because in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost blew through the upper room, they stood around in verse number 37 and they asked him, what, what do we do? How do we get this? What are we, what, what are we supposed to do? We're pricked in our hearts. And, and we say unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then said Peter unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's not done. Keep reading for the promise is unto you and to your children. You've got enough space. And to that are afar off. You've got enough space. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. you got enough space. Keep going. we got two more verses. Don't pause. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. And they that gladly received his word. Those that took the keys that he handed them, repent and be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. Those that took him at his word and did what he said the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 
You know what the space of grace is for? The space of grace is so that laborers can go into the vineyard and take the master's harvest back to him. The space of grace is for revival. The space of grace is for getting my mind right. The space of grace is for getting my priorities right. The space of grace is for miracle signs and wonders that will build large platforms for you and I to preach boldly the word of God. And lastly, as the church stands with me, a nail. He says in Ezra, holy place. And the arguments abound as singers come. Judah, Jerusalem, those are both mentioned. The restoration process as a whole or the restored temple, can I tell you? Literally, figuratively, spiritually speaking, it's all the same. It's all the same. The idea is that the nail of Isaiah 22 was a tent peg fixed. The idea that the nail in the holy place was fixed. The importance to understand that the one who's going to be the nail is going to be the one operating the keys. The space of grace is not just for you to get the Holy Ghost. The space of grace is for you to fix yourself in Jerusalem, which those who have the Spirit of God one day will be a fixed. He calls us pillars. Pillars. Brother, would you do me a favor? Just walk right over here. You see that big column right there? Now, the construction workers, we wouldn't call that up. He works out at the same gym I do. He's a strong guy. I just want you to kind of push on a little bit. Brother Philip, why don't you go over there and help him? Just, just, y'all just kind of gather together. Just push, just push. Just, y'all, everybody look over here, Brother Trey. Y'all give Brother Trey, Brother Philip a big hand. Well, don't, don't push that way, Brother Philip. Put, put, get on his side. Yeah, get, y'all, y'all, y'all push together. Yeah. Now, I just want you to put, I, mean, I want to hear some gritting and some groaning. I want to hear some belt snapping and some shoelaces screaming. Pretty solid, ain't it? Pretty solid, ain't it? I want you to take the space of grace. Ezra, what are you talking about, man? I'm talking about a space of time where you allow a remnant to escape and you allow us to become a nail fixed in your holy place. Fixed. Nobody wondering where you are. Nobody wondering what you're doing. Nobody wondering what you're thinking. I mean fixed. Fixed. Pegged down. Jesus. A pillar in the house of God. A fixture in the temple of God. So that our eyes could be enlightened. Don't you know the psalmist said, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. You say, what are you trying to call me? Hopefully simple. Because it means you're not overthinking things. It means you take things at their face value. It means that whether you can articulate and explain it or not, you understand there's a day coming where the elements shall melt with fervent heat and you got to have a ticket to get out of here. It's simple. And to those who will look at it simply, the space of grace allows them to fix themselves in the church. And the church will not be present when the wrath of God is being poured out on the face of the earth. Revive us! So, well, I'm not dead, I'm here. Okay. But Paul said in chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin. And David said, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin. And my mother conceived me. I was born dead. And I need revival. I need the divine resuscitation where God breathes into me the breath of life. And I am filled with his pneuma, his breath, his spirit. 
And I don't just need it once. I need it today. In the space of grace, if it's available tomorrow, look at your neighbor and say, if. If it's available to me tomorrow, I need it. And if we wake up on Tuesday and the space of grace is still for us, then I need it. And if, because the space of grace is so that I would use the keys and fix myself as a permanent fixture. You know, anybody know why they call them light fixtures? Because they're not seasonal. We change the runner on the table from red in, 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 in the fall, from orange in the fall to red at Christmas to, to, to pink or yellow. It is, it's seasonal. But the light fixtures, raise your hand, husbands, if you change the light fixture to represent the season this year. Whatever. You ain't never changed a light fixture in your life. Somebody say the church is fun, ain't it? Now listen, I want you to be a fixture. God, you gave us a space of grace. You changed the minds of kings. You pried us out of the hands of evil tyrants. You saved us to give us a space of grace so we could fix ourselves. That no matter what seasonal wind is blowing, I'm here. Mountain high, valley low. Ascending, descending. I want to be a fixture in the house of God. Souls Harbor and guests in the house. I invite you to an altar. These altars are open. Sister Chelsea's going to sing. I invite you to an altar for just a little while. I invite you to an altar for a space of grace. I invite you to an altar for what is a brief moment in the history of mankind. I invite you to an altar where wrong things can be made right, where hurts don't have to turn into hang-ups. I invite you to an altar where offenses can be places you launch from. I invite you to an altar where yesterdays are made brand new and they're called tomorrow. I invite you to an altar where he can put your mind to peace. I invite you to an altar where he can put your life on the right path. I invite you to an altar where the prince of the power of the air can be shut up from speaking into your ears and where the prince of peace can take his rightful position in the throne, not only his throne, but in the throne of your life where you become a fixture. You're a regular. You're a constant in the house and in the spirit of God. Sing, Sister Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us for service today on live stream. If you'd like to see more content from Souls Harbor, you can check our YouTube channel out. And if you'd like to know some details about the various ministries of Souls Harbor, you can see some of that on our website. We're praying for you and believing that God's moving on you and that his hand is going to work a miracle in your life.